The wonderful thing about trusting Christ as Saviour is that the moment we do, everything in life falls into place. Suddenly our marriage works, our bank accounts are filled with money, no more struggles and suffering. The children do well, even the cat is more obedient, right? Yes, not so much. There are preachers today that seek to sell the gospel as a life of health, wealth and prosperity, that if we have enough faith, everything works out just the way we want it. But that isn't what God promised. Jesus said, they hated me, they are going to hate you. And the New Testament talks repeatedly about expecting trials. The Bible is the story of people struggling at times to make sense of where is God in the midst of all this. Again and again, the psalmists cry out to God and wonder what is God doing? And where is God in the most difficult times of life? And Habakkuk struggled to make sense of where God is in the midst of the circumstances of life. If you have a Bible, I'd invite you to turn to Habakkuk. Just go to the book of Matthew, go backwards a little and you will find it. Not a lot is known about Habakkuk. We know that he was a prophet of God, possibly a temple musician, because of a reference to music that he makes. But other than that, not a lot is known. We know that he was a, a contemporary of Jeremiah, and we know a lot about the circumstances during this time period. At this time, Israel was divided into two kingdoms, the north and the south. The north was Israel, and the south was Judah. Israel had one wicked king after another. They were conquered by the Assyrians and hauled off into captivity, and Judah knew that their time was limited before the Assyrians would come for them. But the Babylonians began to come to power, and they began to move to the region, and Assyria had to ignore Judah and battle the Babylonians. So, for a time, Judah was left alone, and there was a relative peace and prosperity. The king in Judah was Josiah, a good king. He had led the people back to God, and the people were prospering. But Egypt decided to move across the land of Israel in order to join forces with Assyria to conquer upcoming Babylon. So, as Egypt was coming, Josiah and his army went out to stop them. Josiah was killed, and his son was put on the throne. He lasted about two months, and through the powers of Egypt he was removed, and his brother Jehoiakim was put on the throne. Now, Jehoiakim was a puppet of Egypt, ruling in Judah. And he was evil, abusive and violent. And it's during the reign of Jehoiakim that Habakkuk is writing and is trying to figure out, God, why are you allowing this wicked king to reign? This is the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet received. Now, oracle means burden. So this is the burden that Habakkuk saw, and it created this tension that now he's bringing to God. A prophet speaks for God to the people. But uniquely, Habakkuk is actually speaking to God about the people. And what Habakkuk is going to struggle with is trying to make sense of where is God in the midst of these troubling circumstances. So I would invite us to consider what it is in our life that's keeping us awake at night. What is it that just isn't making sense? 
What is it that causes us to say, I don't understand God? I don't understand why these circumstances have to be this way and I don't understand how God fits into all this. You see, if we can capture whatever that is in our world, it helps us understand what Habakkuk is struggling with and it can help us with our struggles too. How long, O oh Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen or cry out to you violence, but you do not save. He calls out literally his screaming at God. That's the word. There is a terror that if something doesn't change, these Assyrians are going to come and wipe them out just like they did Israel. And yet God doesn't do anything. And with this feeling of helplessness, as he screams out to God, he asks, why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. The court system has become so corrupt that even though they are abused and mistreated, there's nowhere to turn. And therefore, the law is paralysed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. Verse 4 is interesting because it gives the recipe for the demise of any nation in very simple language. So let's review some terms. First, the term wicked is a Hebrew word meaning someone who is willing to disadvantage the community in order to advantage him or herself. It's really important to understand that wicked doesn't just describe murderers, rapists and people like that. Wicked describes those people whose orientation in life is selfish that if necessary, they will disadvantage others to advantage themselves. The end of the day, it's all about me, you see. Now, the righteous is the opposite of that. It's a Hebrew word which means willing to disadvantage him or herself in order to advantage the community. The word justice is the Hebrew word mishpat. It has the idea of fairness without respect to race, economics or gender, whether it's an orphan, a widow or an immigrant. It's a culture that gives everybody a chance. When a community is made up of the righteous, well, you have a community of people who, if necessary, will disadvantage themselves in order to advantage the larger community, creating a community where everyone is treated rightly and fairly, regardless of who they are. And this creates what the Old Testament would refer to as shalom, not just peace, but the idea of wholeness and everybody flourishes in this community. But when the wicked overpower the righteous, then it's no longer truly a community, but a collection of individuals where each person is in it for themselves. And if necessary, I will disadvantage the community in order to advantage myself. At that point, Justice becomes perverted. There is no shalom. It becomes the law of the jungle and the culture slowly disintegrates into chaos. Now that's what Habakkuk is seeing and is crying out to God. Why would you allow this? Why wouldn't you do something to stop it? Now, this is a question I get often. If your God is so good and so loving and compassionate, how do you explain all the evil in the world? And where was God 
when this was happening to me? And if you think about it, it's a legitimate question. And usually my response is, what would you like God to do? Should God just kill everyone who is evil? Then who defines evil? And how evil is too evil? And if your brother, sister, husband, wife, child or your good friend is evil, should God kill them? Isn't it true that you were evil before you came to Christ? Selfishness was at the centre of your life. Should God have just killed you? Where does that start and stop, you see? Who decides that? Who's evil enough or selfish enough for God to kill them? So we end up with nothing left but trusting God as the sovereign God to do what he knows is best, understanding that sometimes that makes sense to me and sometimes it doesn't. So God responds, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. Now you have to imagine Habakkuk is saying, finally, I've been crying out to God year after year and finally God's going to do something. Hallelujah. But he has no idea what God is about to do. I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwelling places not their own. They are feared and dreaded people. They are a law to themselves and promote their own honour. And you have to imagine at that moment Habakkuk says, I'm sorry, what did you say? In other words, if you thought Judah was wicked, you ain't seen nothing yet. Look at how the Babylonians are described. They were dreaded and feared. We would say might makes right and right is whatever they need it to be in order to get their way. A lot of people in the world believe relativism is the way to peace. Relativism, there are no absolutes. All roads lead to God. Sometimes when someone says to me, there are no absolutes, I ask, are you absolutely sure? But people talk about no absolutes because they say, if you stand on an absolute, that causes war and killing. So a lot of people buy into that. But at the end of the day, it's just the opposite. As long as there is no absolute standard and no absolute truth, eventually someone will take over and the majority will dominate the minority and right and wrong and good and evil will be defined by the majority as what is necessary in order to win. And as for these Babylonians, their horses are swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their cavalry gallops headlong. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like a vulture swooping to devour. They all come bent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind and gather prisoners like sand. They deride kings and scoff at rulers. They laugh at all fortified cities. They build earthen ramps and capture them. Then they sweep past like the wind and go on. A very graphic description of the power of the Babylonians and their army. And they have crushed the Assyrians. They have crushed the Egyptian and there's nothing left than to sweep in and to crush those in Judah and haul the remainders off into captivity. It's an absolutely terrifying description. 
They are guilty men whose own strength is their God. Now, some people see a difficulty in this. God says, I am raising up the Babylonians. So does that mean God is for evil? Does that mean God wants that? It almost sounds like we are saying God favours tragedy. God favours pain and suffering in the world. Sometimes we need to be careful that we aren't claiming what we don't really know. There is a mystery with a sovereign God. Sometimes it's hard to figure out what is going on. But at the end of the day, God is not for evil. God is not writing the Babylonians a blank check and saying, it's okay because I'm using evil to bring forth good. Just the opposite. I will judge them for their action. You know, it's interesting how geography affects our view of God. For example, we in the West have a lifestyle that is probably better than anywhere else in the world. We easily embrace the idea of the love of God. What people struggle with is the concept of a God of judgment. How could God be a God of judgment? He's a God of love. Over the last few years, we've moved on even to the point of Maybe there isn't a hell and everybody gets into heaven that it's one big happy family because we just can't cope with the idea of a God of judgment. But in most places in the world, it's the opposite. When everything that you have loved and cared about has been murdered, raped or tortured, you easily embrace the idea of a God of judgment. All you have left is, maybe, when the story is told, God will judge them for what they have done. What they struggle with is the concept of a God of love. How could God be loving in the midst of such horror and pain and suffering? Do you see it? Geography dramatically affects our view of God. But at the end of the day, the scripture is clear. God is a God of love and a God of judgment. And it's precisely because he is a God of love that he must be a God of judgment. Habakkuk is processing this. O oh Lord, are you not from everlasting, my God, my Holy One? We will not die. Now, clearly, Habakkuk is a godly man. He has a very strong and correct view of God. So he acknowledges God. You know, you're everlasting, aren't you? You are God. He refers to him as Lord, meaning Yahweh, Jehovah. You are the God that made a promise to us. You are our personal God. You are Elohim. You are God. You are God of the universe. You are the Holy One. You are set apart. You are unlike any other God. He knows that. And that's why he says, we will not die. Is referring to the fact that I know that you are God and I know that you are Yahweh. You've made a promise and I know that you'll keep that promise. So we can't all be wiped out because then you will not be able to keep your promise. So something has to happen here because there is still the fulfillment of the promise that God made to them as a nation. That's what Habakkuk is saying. O oh Lord, you have appointed them to execute judgment. O oh rock, you have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. So he knows that God isn't for evil. It's not for violence, it's not for wickedness, even though he's going to use the Babylonians to discipline and correct his people, God's not for that behaviour. 
But this is the tension. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? He has the right theology but can't figure it out. Then why are you doing this? Why would you raise up the Babylonians to inflict that on us and your people? You know, I think sometimes there's a tendency to think that if I have a high view of God and a right theology, that takes all the tension out of the struggles of life. It's probably the opposite. When we have a messed up, warped view of God and difficult times come, things happen in the world that make no sense. It just kind of filters into a warped view of God. It's like, who knows? God's all messed up anyway. But the more we have a correct view of God's sovereignty and we say, I believe with all my heart, God is good, loving, faithful and merciful. I believe that with all my heart. It creates a tension with the circumstances of life. I don't get this. It doesn't fit in alignment with who I know God to be. Now, that's what Habakkuk is saying. God, I just can't make sense of this because it seems so contrary to who you are. And he does make an interesting statement in verse 13 when referring to the people of Judah as being more righteous than the wicked Babylonians. This is the same Habakkuk who earlier said, God, these people are so wicked, so violent, rebellious and destructive. Why don't you do something to them? But now, when God is raising up the Babylonians who seem so much worse, he says, God, why would you do that? and use the wicked people to punish the righteous. And maybe he's referring to the righteous still among them in the nation that will also suffer the same consequences. But he does raise an interesting question. Which wickedness do you think is more offensive to God? The wickedness of the godless pagans? or the wickedness among God's own people. It's easy to look at the wickedness in the world that's going on by people that don't know God and throw stones at them and complain. But frankly, I would expect that behaviour from them. They don't know God. They are enslaved to sin. I would expect them to rebel against God. That makes sense. What's harder to make sense of is the wickedness among God's own people. How do we explain people that sin in the face of God and it doesn't face them? And in God's economy, how does he look at one versus the other? The New Testament says that right now God is much more focused on his own people, on his church, on his bride, judging and purifying his bride. Someday he will judge the wicked and godless. But right now he concentrates on his own people. We are disciplined and corrected so that we experience the life that he offers and can be a light into the darkness. But Habakkuk goes on. God, you have made men like fish in the sea, like sea creatures that have no ruler. The wicked foe pulls all of them up with hooks. He catches them in his net. He gathers them up in his drag net. And so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and burns incense to his drag net, for by his net he lives in luxury and enjoys the choicest food. Is he to keep on emptying his net, destroying nations without mercy? 
you see the graphic imagery? The Judeans are like fish in the sea. And the Babylonians are going to throw out their net and catch them. They are going to hook them and drag them off into captivity, making their lives miserable. And chapter one ends without the tension resolved. Nobody walks away today saying, oh, I get it, because you still feel the tension deeply. For those who struggle trying to make sense of your circumstances in life right now, we leave it unresolved and continue the discussion next time. What makes Habakkuk different from other Old Testament prophets is that this is a record of his prayer life. If we want to know someone, listen to their prayers. That's what we get with this man. And there are two issues Habakkuk struggled with in prayer, and it will sound a familiar echo in our lives. First, Habakkuk is battling with disappointment with God. And it's because Habakkuk believed that God is just, it causes him to ask, why do you make me look at injustice? It's an honest question. When an atheist doubts, he thinks that God might be there. Little boy said to his atheistic parents, do you think God knows we don't believe in him? You see, atheists don't feel disappointment in God because they expect nothing. But we commit our lives to God and expect something in return. So when it doesn't happen, we're confused. Where are you, God? What are you doing? Now, Habakkuk brings his questions to God, and so can we. He is praying, God, do something. And God says, I am, I am, but you won't believe how I'm doing it. I'm going to bring justice through those who are unjust. You can't do that, God. There you are. I told you you wouldn't believe me. No wonder Habakkuk is confused. Babylon was ordained to punish Judah. In his bewilderment, Habakkuk says, Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. And that was not true. God could stand by and did. Imagine a commando in a war behind enemy lines. Now, his goal is to destroy a bomb factory. He sees a soldier preparing to execute a woman and a child. He could stop it. He could shoot the soldier. But at what cost? Is it possible that a lot of pain God allows is similar? Habakkuk asks, God, is this fair? And people today pull the plug on God for similar reasons. Now, ask questions. That's okay. But don't turn from God. Turn to him. So there's disappointment with God. And secondly, the decaying of society. And don't we see that reflected in our society and is all that we can do about it lament the decline? No, it's not. We don't need to end on a depressing note. I'm glad about that. What's the world coming to? Nothing can be done. We can make a difference. And how? Jesus used the picture of being sought to the society. You are the salt of the earth. He spoke those words to mostly uneducated, ordinary men. In ancient times, salt was highly valued. Romans sometimes paid soldiers with salt. If a soldier failed in his duties, others said he was not worth his salt. 
Much of the salt in Palestine was taken from the Dead Sea. The salt was filled with white minerals resembling salt. Farmers piled this impure salt behind their houses, using it to fertilise their fields. A small amount went a long way on some soils. But when rain came, often the salt was washed away, leaving a useless white sandy substance. All that farmers could do was throw it out for a hard path to be walked on. You see, if salt loses its distinctiveness, it's worthless. And that will be us in a decaying society. We come into contact with it and can't fertilise the good and disinfect the bad. So, we know that we're living in a sub-social sewer. And like Habakkuk, we can pray, but also, as Jesus shows, we can retain our distinctiveness. We don't have to become part of the problem, but part of the solution. Offer our bodies as living sacrifices. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. We can make a difference in our community, in our circle of influence, so that people will say, I don't know what those people in that church building believe, but I do know this is a better community because they are here. <laughs>